Hey there students, this is Dr. Spellman and today we're going to talk about Walter Sinna Armstrong's paper It's Not My Fault, Global Warming and Individual Moral Obligations. So below we have a picture of Walter Sinna Armstrong. I've met him a couple times uh, over the years and usually when I see him he hasn't looked like that. He's looked a little bit more like this. He's got some, some cool kind of crazy hair going on there and uh, yeah, he's, a, he's an interesting fellow for sure. So to start out, uh, we want to ask the question that we sort of want to ask with any paper that we read. What's this author's thesis? Um, and Sina Armstrong has sort of a subtle take. Um, generally speaking, he thinks we're not responsible or it's not, it's, uh, it's not the case that we're doing anything wrong when we emit greenhouse gases. Um, but that's not quite what he's saying here. Uh, rather, what he's saying here is that we don't know that we're obligated to reduce our individual emissions. So he sort of hedges a little bit, right? Um, the thought might be, like, maybe we're obligated to reduce our individual emissions, but he can't really come up with a good argument showing why that is. So we don't know that we are uh, obligated to do that. What we do know, however, and this is sort of emphasized at the end, is that we should be working to get our government to prevent excessive global warming. In this paper, Senator Armstrong makes some assumptions. So one, he assumes that global warming has begun and it's likely to increase over the next century. Two, that humans are responsible for a significant amount of the warming. Three, that global warming will cause climate changes. For example, violent storms, floods, droughts, heat waves, etc. That the poor are going to be hurt most of all by these changes. That the biggest, richest governments are able to mitigate global warming. That it's too late to stop global warming, and therefore the governments need to adapt to it. That adapting is going to be costly, and it's going to slow the economy. And finally, the governments, especially the U.S. government, are obligated to adapt. So if we look through these, right, again, the general idea is that global warming is happening, uh, humans are responsible for it, it's going to have these effects, those effects are going to hurt people who are poor. So that's the sort of the first part. The second part is about governments, uh, governments' responsibility to mitigate climate change and global warming, and that um, they're capable of doing that. It's going to harm the economies, but they have to do it anyways. Given these assumptions, Senator Armstrong thinks it's clear that governments have an obligation to prevent excessive global warming. The question is whether individuals have a similar obligation. Do I, do you, have an obligation to, to reduce our uh, our global sort of uh, footprint, our carbon footprint. It's plausible that if governments are morally obligated to do something, then citizens are morally obligated to do that thing as well. But is that true? Senator Armstrong thinks that it's not. So he says the fact that a government's obligated to fix the cracks in a bridge, for example, doesn't tell that its citizens are obligated to fix the cracks in the bridge. So if on my way between Bluffton and Ada to work, I find that there's a hole in a bridge, uh, I might call up the, the government and say, hey, get someone out here to fix the hole in the bridge. If the government's not doing it, it's not like I have to go fix the hole. So uh, here we've got a nice picture of someone uh, who, who found a pothole and they filled it in very beautifully and made this nice sort of rose mosaic. Um, that is a good thing to do, but we don't think that the person who filled that in was obligated to do it. Here we've got a couple who is uh, using the pothole as a, as a cooler, uh, and they're keeping their beers in there while they're uh, grilling some hot dogs. They can do that, right? They don't have an obligation. They filled it in with ice, I guess. Uh, they're going to use it to keep their drinks warm. Uh, but but they don't have an obligation to uh, to fix it. 
they're welcome to use it however they want in some sense. We think that that's fine. We don't think, oh my gosh, those people should be fixing that pothole. We think like, haha, that's a funny photo. Uh, I'm glad they're getting some use out of uh, the government's failure uh, to do its job. Now, just because the fact that the government's obligated to do something, uh, we might think it, the fact that the government's obligated to do something doesn't entail that citizens are obligated, but it doesn't work the other way necessarily either. So um, just because the government's obligated to do something doesn't mean we can say that citizens aren't obligated to do that thing. So uh, examples here uh, are maybe a little bit trickier to come by, but we might think that the government has some obligation to prevent uh, harm, uh, that the police force, for example, has to keep an eye on uh, bomb threats or something like that. But if an individual citizen sees a bomb threat and can easily defuse the situation, then the citizen's got to do that too. So we might think the government has this general speaking obligation to uh, reduce harm or prevent harm, but um, if it's not fulfilling that and it's easy for individuals to do it, then then the individuals have to do it. So, um, you know, which one is global warming like? Like, say the government's not taking action on global warming, does that mean citizens have to step up, or are they allowed to to not step up and and not sort of fix the problem that the government's really responsible for in the end? Senator Armstrong says, I'm going to consider driving for fun on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. My drive is not necessary to cure depression or calm aggressive impulses. All that is gained is pleasure. Ah, the feel of the wind in your hair, the views, how spectacular. Of course, you could drive a fuel-efficient hybrid car, but fuel-efficient cars have less get-up-and-go. So let us consider a gas-guzzling sports utility vehicle. Ah, the feeling of power, the excitement. So. Uh, this is a fun little thought experiment, right? That we're we're putting ourselves in the in the uh, in the position of someone driving a uh, you know a gas guzzling SUV uh, for the for the sake of, of of just a fun ride. And so to help you appreciate that, I've sort of I've got this video here that we're going to watch a little bit of. This is basically what I imagine joy riding being like. Maybe I have sort of an extreme version of joy riding in mind. Now, as we watch this guy uh, drive around in this desert, you know, just imagine what it must feel like to be driving like that. It's got to be so much fun, you know. If only he could put the top down on that thing, feel the wind in his hair. It's also some pretty solid Pennzoil, uh, you know, advertisement, product placement uh, things here. But this is the sort of thing that, that Sinar Armstrong, I mean, this is probably, an, like, it's clearly an extreme version of joyriding. Uh, but this is the kind of thing, right, that Sinar Armstrong wants us to imagine. 
You probably don't like climb mountains in your car for fun. Maybe a little bit dangerous. Uh, but I'm sure the guy making this video uh, had a good time here. Joyride. Pencil. All right, to be continued, go to pennzoilsynthetics.com, find out how it ends. Okay, you probably aren't going to find anything there because I think this commercial was made in 2016. So, uh, we'll never know how it ends, but that doesn't matter. The question we want to ask ourselves uh, is this. Is it morally wrong to go to writing? So, now... Maybe we can we can imagine that guy uh, in that commercial, but let maybe let's not imagine quite such an extreme example. Just imagine that you know you're feeling uh, cooped up. You spent too much time inside. You want to go out, feel the wind in your hair. You get in your car and you just drive around 30 minutes an hour or something like that. I um, mean, your car is not you know fuel efficient or electric. Uh, it's a big sort of you know it's a Hummer. Or it's a it's a big SUV. Would that be okay? Now, I'm not sure exactly what you think, right? You know, most people think like, yeah, joyriding is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, and that's uh, not necessarily, so that's maybe the common view. That's not necessarily what Senna Armstrong uh, is going to say. So he says, you know, how's Senna Armstrong going to answer it? thinks, yeah, maybe it is wrong to go for a joyride. That seems, it seems like there's something problematic about it. Um, but what, what is it? So he's not confident that it's wrong. And so what he wants to do is sort of look through some of the, the moral sort of arguments, the more reasons, um, look at our moral theories, right, and figure out, does any of those theories tell me uh, that it's wrong? So uh, he says, why, uh, why might he think it's wrong? He says, maybe he, he thinks that it's wrong um, because he thinks that governments are obligated to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, not necessarily because he is. He says, maybe you know, he's got these environmentalist friends and he wants to like, think like them or not, not make them upset. So maybe he's inclined to, to say that it's wrong. So... Like I said, he's going to try and see if he can derive this judgment, this conclusion, from a moral principle. The first moral principle that he considers is the harm principle, and this is a kind of consequentialist utilitarian principle. So the harm principle says that harming others is wrong. It's wrong to hurt, to hurt people, to cause bad uh, consequences, to cause pain, etc. So if we're going to use that principle, we think, okay, um, how can we use it to come up with an argument? Maybe the argument will go like this. Joyriding harms others. If an act harms others, then it's wrong. That's the harm principle. Conclusion, therefore joyriding is wrong. Now, Sina Armstrong doesn't think this argument's convincing. He's got an objection. The objection's premise one. He says, joyriding doesn't cause harm in the normal cases, at least. So, uh, is that right? Uh, joyriding doesn't cause harm. To imagine why why we should think joyriding doesn't cause harm, uh, we, he thinks we should imagine a flood. Now, this is a, a image of a flood, actually, that was in took place in Boulder, Colorado, uh, when I was living there. Uh, we got a ton of rain up in the mountains, uh, it all sort of was washing down, coming through the rivers, and the rivers ended up eating a, out a bunch of the street. Uh, it destroyed homes, uh, flooded a bunch of others, so uh, it was a big deal. Now imagine that there's this big flood, and that, that you have a gallon of water, uh, and you just sort of walk over uh, to the rushing uh, waves, and you just uh, pour it in. You just uh, you just add some water to the flood. 
is there anything wrong with that? Uh, well, I don't know. In some sense, it doesn't seem great. But when we think about, let's not think about, is it wrong, right? Let's think about, does it cause any harm? And Senator Armstrong's point is like, there's already so much water. <laughs> Adding a gallon to it, a bucket, you know, five gallons even, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, whatever harm was going to happen because of the flood is going to happen. Your extra bucket of water is not going to not going to cause any additional damage. So uh, the same is true, he thinks, with with global warming and climate change. So the fact that you went out and went joyriding isn't going to cause any additional uh, warming. Um, your contribution to CO two in the atmosphere is so small. Uh, that it, nobody additional will be harmed. It, it just doesn't make a difference. Therefore, right, your action doesn't harm anyone, and so we can't explain the wrongness by appealing to something like the harm principle. All right. So that harm argument is going to be the sort of primary one but that Sinat Armstrong is making, but we can look at the others. So one is, he says, well, what about the universalizability principle? Again, this is a sort of Kantian deontological view we considered earlier this semester. We spent some time talking about it. And this principle says, acting on maxims that we can't will to be universal laws uh, is morally wrong. So there's something wrong with acting on a principle that we don't want to universalize. Now, joyriding, we might think it involves acting on a maxim that we can't will to be a universal law. And if an act involves acting on a maxim that we can't will to universal law, then it's wrong. Therefore, joyriding uh, is wrong. Now, again, we have an objection to premise one of this argument. And the objection says, uh, joyriding involves acting on a maxim to have harmless fun. So uh, we can will that that maxim be a universal law. So here, I think, Maybe Senator Armstrong is is doing something shady, <laughs> but um, on the one hand, we might think what we're doing when we joyride is acting on this maxim, like uh, when I want to uh, have fun, I'll get in my car and go for a drive, or uh, if you know emitting CO two is fun, then I'll do it, or whatever. But sen Senator Armstrong doesn't want to put the maxim exactly that way. He just says, well, imagine the maxim you're acting on, the principle. Um, so you're not thinking about it like that. So you're thinking about it more like this. You're thinking, should I, can I go for a joyride? You say, I don't know. Does it cause any harm? You think, no, it doesn't cause any harm. And uh, it's fun. And so what you end up doing is you're like, well, I'm going to go do this thing that is fun and doesn't harm anyone. <laughs> Is, can we act on that? Can we universalize that maxim? And he thinks the answer is yes. So uh, that means premise one is false, uh, and the argument is unsound as a result. So that argument's not going to work. Uh, how about the means principle? Right? Treating others as a mere means is morally wrong. So joyriding, you might think, treats others as a means. Again, this is a um, Kantian, deontological kind of principle. If an act treats others as a mere means, then it's morally wrong. Therefore, joyriding is morally wrong. How should we object to this? Again, premise one. So in each of these cases, note, Senator Armstrong goes after premise one. He's not going to criticize the moral principle because he's just sort of saying, does any moral principle get us the conclusion that joyriding is wrong? And what he wants to argue is that none of them can. Uh, so he has to, he can't ever attack the moral principle, he's got to attack the, the empirical principle. So here he says, you know, treating someone as a mere means involves using that person to achieve your goals. But joyriding doesn't involve using anyone to achieve your goals, right? You're not using anybody. Um, you might think, well, I'm harming someone. But remember, his point is like, no, you're not harming anyone when you go joyriding. Your contribution to global emissions is so small that it doesn't cause any harm. Finally, Senator Armstrong is going to consider the virtue principle or sort of virtue ethical argument against joyriding. 
So that virtue principle says this, performing acts that express vices is morally wrong. So how's the argument going to go uh, here? Well, we're going to start with premise one, right? This says joyriding expresses a vice. Premise two says if an act expresses a vice, then it's morally wrong. Conclusion, therefore joyriding is morally wrong. So how does this argument go? You know, why does joyriding express a vice? Maybe you think it's selfish, right, to go joyriding. Um, but again, maybe that depends on the assumption that joyriding causes harm. Joyriding causes harm, maybe it's not selfish. Um, but let's say, you know, we think that it's selfish. If an act expresses uh, selfishness, then it's wrong, so joyriding is wrong. How's Sina Armstrong gonna object? Again, he's gonna object to premise one. It says, on the face of it, joyriding expresses a desire for fun. So to apply this principle, the virtue principle, we need some antecedent test of when an act expresses a vice. So here he's saying, we need to know when exactly something's too selfish or uh, when something does count as selfish or disrespectful or you know, whatever the vice that we think is, is relevant here is. And so I think his point here is he's imagining it seems like somebody can go joyriding not because they're selfish, but just because they like to have fun or they haven't had fun in a while and they want to do something fun that's harmless. And he thinks there's nothing necessarily vicious about that. So at this point, Senator Armstrong has surveyed a bunch of different sort of moral principles. Um, in the excerpt we read, he's looked at a kind of consequentialist or utilitarian principle. He's looked at some deontological ones. He's looked, looked at a virtue ethical one. Uh, in the full piece, he considers even more. Um, he sort of goes through all of them and says, you know, none of these arguments is any good. None of them gets us the conclusion that we want, which is that joyriding is morally wrong. So he says, we're left with no defensible principle to support the claim that I have a moral obligation not to drive a gas guzzler just for fun. Does this show that the claim is false? And again, here he sort of hesitates. He says, it only shows that we don't know whether it's morally wrong. So uh, he's not saying that uh, we know for sure it's fine to drive a gas guzzler or to go joyriding. Instead, he says, well, we at least we can't be sure that doing that is morally wrong. Now, he's quick to point out that his conclusion is consistent with a number of other things that we think. So it's he's not saying that it's uh, it's good to go joyriding. He admits, like, maybe it's best not to. You better not to. Um, he also says that his conclusion is consistent with the with thinking that we're ju justified sometimes in publicly condemning those who drive wastefully. So even if it's we're not, you know, acting wrongly when we go joyriding, um, when our friends aren't acting wrongly when they go joyriding, it might be okay, nevertheless, to call our friends out for it and to criticize them, to say boo, you're a bad person. Um, why? Well, maybe that has good consequences, or maybe there are you know, good effects to that. Um, just because on Senator Armstrong's view, maybe that's not uh, true, doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, sometime engage in, in condemnation of those people. And he also says we're justified in raising our children. We'd feel bad about driving wastefully. Maybe it's okay to to get our kids to think, oh yeah, this is a bad thing. Uh, he's just not sure that that claim is true, uh, but it's okay to get people to think it. Right? That might have good consequences after all. So he says, buying fuel-efficient cars, insulating our houses, setting up a windmill to make our own electricity, all those things are wonderful, but they do little or nothing to stop global warming. Nor uh, does this kind of focus fulfill our real obligation, which are to get governments to do their job to prevent the disaster of excessive global warming. So in the end, Senator Armstrong thinks we don't have a duty to reduce our individual emissions, but we do have a duty to reduce our collective emissions. So the argument against the duty to reduce our individual emissions goes like this. Um, reducing our individual emissions doesn't prevent harm, and if an act doesn't prevent harm, then we aren't obligated to do it. So we're not obligated to reduce our individual emissions. 
argument for our duty to reduce our collective emissions sort of the flip side of that, right? Reducing our collective emissions prevents harm, and if an act prevents harm, then we've got to do it. Therefore, we are obligated to reduce our collective emissions. And then the final step to this argument, right, is just noting that reducing our collective emissions is going to involve working to change the laws. So it's not important to stop joyriding, but he thinks we are obligated to change the laws, maybe to prevent joyriding, make joyriding illegal. Uh, that could be something uh, that we would want to do. That law, right, that law change is going to make a big difference. If nobody's joyriding, um, then now we might see some significant impacts on the global CO2 levels. Um, but if just you stop joyriding, there's not going to be any significant difference. So if we're obligated to reduce our collective emissions, and that involves working to change the laws, then the conclusion is that we're obligated to work to change the laws. So that's the end of, of Sina Armstrong's paper. He thinks we don't have in individual obligations to reduce our emissions, but we do have obligations to work towards reducing those emissions collectively. Uh, for next time, you want to take a look at Marion Hardequin's Climate uh, Collective Action and Individual Ethical Obligations. That paper addresses some of the arguments that uh, Senna Armstrong makes in the paper just looked at. So take a look at that and complete the reading quiz for that paper. All right, have a good one.